Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning up there. Good morning down here. Good morning over there. Welcome. And if you're watching by uh, delayed uh, recording on uh, YouTube or on our app, welcome today. Glad you're with us. Glad you're all here. Real quickly, we'll make this uh, quick, but I hope informative. We go through a few things in your, uh, that you might have in your hand, your bulletin. Please take some time to fill out this because you count form. It's important that we have some updated information. We are working towards a, a new church directory, and we want our information to be accurate. Uh, at the same time, and you'll see information in the bulletin about that uh, new directory that's coming, and uh, many of you have probably already gotten some calls and information about signing up for a time to have your pictures taken. So fill out that and drop it in the offering plate a little bit later. You'll see some opportunities to help, um, either in some training or some serving. Also, um, speaking of training, the blue insert, one side you'll see an important uh, a training event coming up, particularly for leaders of the church. You'll be hearing more about this, a safe sanctuary training that really goes beyond that, um, all kinds of uh, things that have to do with the security um, of our ministry. But on the other side, I want to make sure you take note because it really impacts this group, and that's next Sunday. What's happening next Sunday morning at this time? Okay, good, you got it. Worship in the park, that's going to be a combined worship service between Christ First and Grace Churches. If you would like to sing in a combined choir, I see a few voices out there. You can come at 1030 and we will uh, work on a song that will be part of that worship gathering. So come on out uh, next Sunday, bring a lawn chair. Uh, also, um, a reminder that there will be no 935 service next Sunday because of that. We need a little time uh, between our 815 service, which will take place, and then the 11 o'clock at the park. Um, the purple insert, uh, take a look at that. It has to do with what I already talked about, uh, our directory information relating to that. Your yellow insert is the prayer updates. Please take note of that and keep remembering those um, in prayer that come to us. A little bit later in the service, when we have our prayer time, we invite you to fill out a uh, prayer slip that's in the pew, the yellow or blue slip that you can fill out and drop that in the offering plate sometime, or you can bring it forward during our prayer time later in the service. But that's how these uh, needs and the information gets to the yellow insert. I want to give you just a few updates here. Um, I won't go into detail. These folks are uh, somewhat uh, associated with our earlier services, but please remember these names. I want to circle them. Linda Lawson, Ron Huff, Tom Swab, and Tyler Graves. Um, each of these need prayer for various reasons. Linda Lawson, heart surgery on Tuesday. Ron Huff, a, uh, a, a very delicate biopsy procedure up in his head tomorrow. Tom Swab is uh, struggling to, uh, they're finding, trying to find out what some of uh, um, some remaining issues are in his body. He is at Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh. And little Tyler Graves, eight-year-old, surgery eight months ago to correct some uh, um, issues in his legs. Uh, it just hasn't healed properly, and they're, they're going back to try to figure out what they can do next for the young boy. So they're going to be seeing some specialists this coming Tuesday. Let us remember Tyler Graves, the parents, and Grandpa and Grandma Bill and Shelly Weller. Regarding prayer, we got another pack of uh, prayer requests that came in to the uh, prayer box at the mall. We, uh, we bring these to your attention and uh, we place them on our altar. Uh, pastors will go through these and we're thankful that people... Uh, care enough to submit their needs and they trust us enough to be praying for them. Isn't that special? You folks are special to me, to Pastor Daryl, and you know you're, you're special to one another. That's why we highly value, we highly value um, our fellowship, our hospitality to one another. So at this time, I invite you to stand and, and experience that and and. and and demonstrate that, if you will, by reaching out and greeting one another in the love of Christ.
You may uh, remain standing if you would like. Let's put our voices to work. Let's sing him. What are you turned into?
prayer, please. Lord, we have gathered in this place to worship you. We ask that you would bless every song sung, every praise lifted, every prayer raised to you, and every response given today, O Lord, from the hearts of your people. We pray for your word, that it will come through your spirit and find its place in our hearts. For, Lord, our hearts need you. Lord, we need the transforming power and presence of God today and every day. We're thankful for a God that continues in one way or another in the situations of our life to to know how to turn water into wine, a God who knows how to turn ashes into something of beauty, the one who knows how to turn darkness into light. And in the pain and the suffering, you continue to work in us, changing us, molding us, making us. So hear us today, O Lord, as we call upon you and as we offer our hearts and open them up to you, as we do, O God, we ask that you would speak to each of us in the way that we need to be spoken to and give us receptive ears of faith to know what you have for each of us, we pray. Our song is this, O Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Sing it, church. Here's my heart, Lord. And here's my heart, Lord. Sing what is true. Let's sing that again.
Lord, we give you thanks. Amen. You may be seated with our song, with our uh, expressions of thanks and praise. We sing, and we uh, now offer our thanks with our gifts of offering. The ushers will wait upon us, and it is our way of saying, Lord, thank you. We give of our tangible means as a token of our heartfelt thanks to you. As we give in this fashion, worship in this way, Beth Full was here to offer a very appropriate song as she reminds us that all good gifts, everything that we have, are from God, from heaven above. So Beth, thank you for being here. We got to catch up with Beth on one of her few times that she's in from school and internship at uh, Disney uh, World. And uh, thank you for being here today, Beth. Blessings. Dear God, we give you thanks for all you give to us. Bless each gift, bless each giver, and bless Beth as she sings. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be back among you this morning. 
If you will take out your pew Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, we want to share the first eight verses, but we're really going to only look at the first two, which means there's a lot of ground yet to plow in this text, but we've got time for the first two. Page 1,616, if you want to follow along. Paul is towards the end of his letter to the Romans here. He has spent 11 chapters pouring out deep theology, and he gets to this place, and he wants to to begin to make application. So this is what God inspired him to write. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I managed to preach three times, listen to the ASP Participants come back and take two weeks off. (laughs) Doing pretty good. So in the first three sermons, we, we talked about this theme of a few of my favorite things. These are a few of my favorite passages of Scripture. And this is one that I share with people repeatedly. This in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God knows the plans he has for us. So we want to talk today about the pressure to conform as opposed to the need for transformation, all right? In a town like Franklin, you have a a historic district, and there are buildings that have consistently resisted the desire of many to conform, like this building. There it is. The Venango County Courthouse is an old, old building, but time seems to have not really touched it. It is not conformed to modern architectural desires. It has is, it is stayed there as a, a, a beacon from past times. And so some transformation has happened, I'm sure, inside, but they've transformed the outside a little bit, and it still stands as a mark of history, and it stands in, in time. It's not the only building in Franklin, of course, this is one that I pass almost every day, and I'm just enthralled by. It's called the Commons at Franklin, and originally built as a private residence, which I cannot imagine. This building has resisted the temptation of some to to make a building conform, to, to tear down old and put up new so it always looks new. I gotta be honest with you, in America, we tend to do that a lot, don't we? We constantly tear down stuff and put up new. I was amazed when they tore down Three River Stadium that they still owed millions of dollars on it to put up something new. In 2009, Sharon and I were privileged to take three of the boys and travel to Poland and to be in some truly old structures, a church that was a thousand years old. It had been damaged in wars so many times and every time it resisted the temptation to just tear it down and conform with a new building and instead they would transform it into a wonderful structure that harkened back to the past but continued to function in the present. Well, today we want to talk about this text in Romans and this call of God upon our lives to live a life transformed, not to be people who conform. 
So the first part that we want to get to is, is this first part I've highlighted. If my finger will do what I want it to. Thank you. There we go. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that's what he's been talking about for the first 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You know, in the old sacrificial system, once you put a sacrifice on the altar, it was wholly committed to God. Irretrievable. There, there was nothing left. You didn't, you didn't put a lamb on the altar and kind of slow roast it a bit and take it home and eat it. It was all to God. It was gone. And, and so that image is picked up that, that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, our whole bodies, not just our physical body, but our entire life. Here's the problem with living sacrifices. Living sacrifices tend to crawl off the altar. It's just what happens. I don't know if you've had this experience, but there have been many times in my life where I have spread my body, my life, out on the altar of God and said, God, I am yours. I'll be right back, God. I got Oh, yes, yes, God, God, I'm, I'm, I'm yours. I'm yours. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, God, yeah, I'm, I'm still here, God. Because what happens is in the crisis, we lay on the altar, amen? And as soon as the crisis passes, we get distracted. And we're off doing our own thing. And another crisis happens and we're right back on the altar until that crisis passes and we're off doing our own thing. This text is saying we need to wholly commit all of life, boom, on the altar, irretrievably, unrevocable, given to God. He goes on to say, this is our true and proper worship. Now, let's be honest. When I say the word worship, you most likely go right to Sunday morning. You know, you gather in a space, this space or a space similar to it with some people of God, and you sing songs, you hear the word proclaimed, you, you offer your life and your, and your ties to God, and you go home. And, and some of us get that worship is supposed to be more than just a Sunday spectacle or, or a Sunday that we participate in, that true worship is a constant offering of the whole self. It's not just Sunday in church, but it's Monday at the factory, it's Tuesday at the grocery store, it's Wednesday as we parent, it's Thursday as we study, it's Friday as we serve, it's Saturday as we recreate. Worship, true and proper worship, is 24-7, 365. It's at every moment offering ourselves to God. We do this not because it's an obligation, but it's in response, as the text says, in view of God's mercy. Because God poured out his life on us in, in, in the form of the blood of Christ that cleansed us from our sin and called us to a new life, in response to that, we worship in this fashion. You probably recall being a, a child and, you know, the parents had a rule or somebody had a rule. You, you're going to church. And you're going because you have to. And all of a sudden, at some point, it changes. And you go because you want to. Maybe in the beginning, you read scripture and you prayed because it was what you were supposed to do. And then at some point, it changes. And it just becomes what you have to do. Because if you don't, you feel like you're going to explode. As a pastor, I am privileged and honored to hear people's stories. But that's not always easy. Occasionally, they're stories of great success or how God moved in their life. Occasionally, they are stories of pain or of trauma or of abuse or of broken relationship or of physical lives that have just broken down. And I come away from those, those experiences of interacting with folks in community and I'm just heavy with their burden. And all I can do is say, Lord, I cannot carry this. Uh, you've got you to take it. I can barely handle my own life. I can't deal with all your stuff. 
And we pray. And we make worship a regular experience in our day where we hold up people and situations to God and leave them at his throne. That's true and proper worship. So then Paul moves into the the meat of these two verses when he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform is an imperative. An imperative is where Paul is not saying, you know, if you want, don't conform. Yeah, you might want to try it. If he was standing here, he'd be pining the pope saying, do not conform. It, it, it's a command. It, it's got force behind it. To conform is to be guided by or to be molded by. To, to conform is that, is that idea that, you know, you put a nail on the wall and it leaves a hole. And you want your security deposit back, so somehow you got to get rid of that hole. Well, you try toothpaste, and as you know, that doesn't work. You paint it with about eight coats of paint, but you can still see it. The only hope you have is to dig out the toothpaste and all the extra paint and, and get the right joint compound and, and put it on and let it dry and sand it and put it on and let it dry and sand it and put it on and let it dry and sand it and then paint the whole wall and it will, it will conform. And people will be hard pressed to find that spot in the wall. That's conforming, blending, molding, being invisible, if you will, because you've just fit in. Well, what are we not supposed to conform to? Paul says the pattern of this world. The word for world in Greek that's often used is is cosmos, which is where we get the word cosmos from. And, And it's talking about the physical world and the planets and the stars and all that. But that's not the word he uses here. Here he uses the word eon. And it's more don't conform to this age if you will, this culture. Because, you know, times change, don't they? Any of you who've been around quite a while know that if you hold on to those old clothes long enough, they will come back in style. The only question is, do they fit? I'm I'm really glad that bell bottoms never came back. I I was okay with them leaving. There's some other fashions, too, that I hope never return. And there's some that we have now that I wish would just go away. But that's a conversation for another day. So so Paul is saying with passion, do not conform to this age. Do not allow the culture around you to cause you to blend in. Don't be guided by them. Don't be molded by them. Let's be honest. Culture is really the place of the enemy. The enemy seems to be the one that's in charge and driving that bus. And we don't need that driving our lives. The alternative, he says, is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And and he is saying be transformed with the same force that he says do not conform. Be transformed. To be transformed, the Greek word is is metamorphe, and and meta in Greek means change, and morphe is form. So he's saying, change form. We run into this word in the Gospels when Jesus goes up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah show up. And the Gospel writers record that Jesus is transformed, transformed. Figured. Something happens to his outward appearance that is so radical that it causes Peter to just open his mouth and constantly change feet because he doesn't know what to say. That's the image here. Transformed. Now, wouldn't it be nice if when you became a Christian, all of a sudden you had the right amount of hair, your weight was exactly perfect, your appearance was like, I don't know, a model's, you know, and, and you were just gorgeous all of a sudden. I mean, it'd be kind of boring. We'd be sitting at church and everybody look alike. But some of you were like, I'd take that. But as we know, that doesn't happen, does it? In fact, when we get saved, sometimes our health doesn't get any better either. So so the transformation he's talking about is not an outward transformation. It's an internal transformation. We go from sinner to saint 
but more importantly, we are transformed within. Now, the word metamorphe is also where we get the English word metamorphosis from. And some of you have just had those flashbacks. You go, okay, fifth grade science. I know there was something about that word. Others of you actually remember that it's something about a caterpillar that transforms, that, that goes through a metamorphosis into a pupa state and then pops out a butterfly. Now, that's pretty radical, isn't it? From a bug with a bunch of legs to a beautiful flying insect that drinks nectar. As one scholar said, a metamorphosis develops into something that has never existed before. Let that sink in a minute. God is calling you to not conform to culture, but to be transformed, to be changed into something that has never existed before. Wow. How does he want you to do that? By the renewing of your mind. Renewing, renovating, rehabilitating the way we think the way we perceive, the way we understand, the way we respond. That's being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what's that going to get us? Quite simply, that's going to get us the ability to test and approve what God's will is. He's calling us to be able to to examine, to scrutinize God's will and to know when it's God speaking. When it's God moving in our lives and when it's not. Both when it is God blessing us and when it's God's call upon our lives to respond in some way. Some of you recall that time in life when you were young and you're trying to think, okay, what's God's will for my life? What what should I do with my life? Who should I marry? Should I buy a house? Should I have kids? Should I take this job? Some of you are past all that. I'm pretty sure I've figured out what I'm going to do when I grow up. I think I'm going to try to keep doing this as long as they'll let me. I figured out who to marry. We've been married 20 years. She hasn't killed me yet, so that's pretty good. You need to pray for her. Just saying. But what do I do? When someone comes and shares their story, how should I respond? What, what, what should my views be on something I see on the news? Or how do I make a difference in the life of someone who's really struggling? You see, that level of understanding God's will for our lives is tough. Amen? To, to, to be able to move through your daily experience and be confident at every step that you're hearing God's voice and you're knowing how to respond. To people you bump into in Walmart. To the person that just cuts you off going down the road. To the coworker that makes you crazy. To the relatives who are struggling or the friend whose husband just left them. To the child who is so traumatized by life that they don't know how to act right. What's God's will for me in that moment? You see, that takes transformation. That takes allowing God to change us. Here's the reality, folks. There's a lot of pressure to conform. We're called to conform and look like other people. We're called to conform in in different situations, in, in patterns. If you're over 45, maybe there's not as much pressure. But if you're under 18, quite honestly, the rest of us don't know how hard it is. Because social media has made that much harder than it used to be. Some of you adults even know that because you see your friends on social media and you're like, can everything really be that good in their life? I mean, it's not that good in my life. What am I doing wrong? Well, let's be honest, that's their perspective and they're the ones writing the story and they may be messing with the truth just a little bit. Just, just a caution. We're all 
dealing with the pressure to conform. But instead of conforming, we need to resist that pressure. We need to say no to people who want us to just fit in. Quit coloring outside the lines, they'll say. Quit rocking the boat. Even in families that are highly dysfunctional, people begin to get healthy and the rest will get angry at them. What are you doing? Why are you, why are you shining the light on this? Leave it alone. Just conform. Just blend in. Just become invisible. No. I think we need to resist that and we need to be transformed by God so we stick out like a sore thumb or should I say like a sore toe. I've ever had this experience, but one day when I was younger, uh, in, in 94, 95, I was single. One Sunday morning, I wasn't preaching that morning, but I was headed to church, and I wasn't up yet. The, the boys were downstairs watching TV, and, and all of a sudden, they hollered, Dad, there's deer in the side yard. Well, you don't have to know me very long to know that it doesn't matter how many deer I see, I always want to see another one. So I jumped out of bed really fast, and my whole body came out of my waterbed, all except my little toe. And it caught on that board that's right there holding in that mattress and it snapped and I screamed. It was weeks that it was obvious that I did something to my foot. I hobbled around like a lame mule. I stuck out like a sore toe. God is calling us to resist the temptation to conform and to stick out like a sore toe. So how are you going to become transformed? By working harder? Well, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Maturity, which is what we're talking about here, becoming more mature in Christ, being transformed in our mind, it doesn't come because you believe the right things, do the right things, and serve the right way. It's all an act of grace. You are saved by grace. That's justification. And sanctification is a process where his grace comes in and transforms us. Our job, stay on the altar. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. Allow the Holy Spirit to come in and work on us bit by bit by bit. Trust the Holy Spirit. God knows what's best for you. He made you. He's the perfect parent. He's the perfect God. If you want transformation, stillness in his presence is a necessity. You can't do it while you're running 100 mile an hour chasing culture. You're going to look just like culture. It's going to take time of surrender, just being quiet in his presence. Allowing him to speak to you through scripture, through prayer, through worship, convicting your heart of sin, pointing out you places where you need to be transformed more deeply. So it begs the question, where are you currently conforming to culture where you're starting to blend in? Is there an area of your life? Maybe in some areas you do stick out like a sore thumb, a sore pinky, a sore toe. But in some areas or on some people, you become imperceivable from the culture around you. Where are those areas? Where are those areas that God needs you to be transformed? In other words, what's guiding you? What's, what's working in you to change you? Is it God's transformation or is it the culture around you? Where do you need to yield to God's spirit of transformation? Is it in your spiritual life, maybe your devotional time or your prayer time or your scripture reading time? That's called the upward journey, our journey with God. Maybe that's where your transformation needs to be worked on. Maybe that's where you need greater surrender. Do you need to yield to God's transformation in your self-awareness, your self-care, your self-perception and understanding? That's called the inward journey. You know, maybe you, you believe what somebody told you a long time ago, that you're junk, that you're broken beyond repair, that, that you're not worth anything. 
And maybe you've been buying that for a very long time. And God needs you to stop conforming to that message and be transformed and realize you are a loved child of God. Not because of what you do, not because of what you have to offer, but because he loves you because you're his. That's called the inward journey. Do you need to yield to God's transformation in your relationships with others? That's called the outward journey. Whether you treat them with respect or not, how you care for, love others. In September, I'm going to preach a four or five part sermon series on these three things. The the upward, inward, and outward journey and the balance to try to keep them all in homeostasis. The problem is we tend to do one of the three better than the other two and the other two. We go, I'm doing okay in this area. I don't need to worry about that. Well, not really true. Where are you conforming? Maybe you already know. Maybe, maybe as soon as I said, where are you conforming, three things came to mind. Or maybe you're still struggling. I, Lord, I, I don't know where. Or maybe you don't know which one to start with. Soak on this. Ask God today to point out to you a place where you're being molded by culture and you're just blending in. Ask him to give you greater ability to stay on that altar as a living sacrifice and allow him to work at transforming you by renewing your mind, by changing your entire outlook, your entire ability to perceive so that you know what his will is. Let's pray. Father God, conforming seems so much easier We tend to ride the current instead of going against it. We tend to simply go with the flow to allow culture to mold us and shape us. Father, give us the courage to crawl upon the altar and stay surrendered that your Holy Spirit can do the difficult but yet awesome work of changing us. Changing our understanding, our perception, our thinking. Lord, we want to have the mind of Christ. We want to see people as you see them. We want to respond to people as you responded. We want to pour into people the way people have poured into us. Father, transform us that we may look more like Christ every single day. We ask this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. As we sing, feel welcome to come, bring prayer slips forward, bring yourselves forward. Maybe you'd like to pause to pray. Allow God to work in your hearts now in a transforming way. Let us stand as we sing together. All I want held
Father God, we love you. We love you for gathering with us this morning and pouring into us so much that we needed. Words of hope, words of truth, words of encouragement, sometimes even words of conviction, Father. We need those as well. Father, draw us into your presence and transform us. Lord, these concerns are just the tip of the iceberg, but for each person, these are the iceberg. Lord, we thank you for your presence, but we pray, Lord, that you would move. Father, either by traditional medicine, by the words of a wise friend, even if they don't know they're wise, or, Father, by miraculous intervention. We're good with any of that. Move in us, through us, around us, in our circumstances, in the things that we are burdened with. Show your face. We thank you, Father. We leave this place filled with joy from you, even though circumstances may still be the same. Continue to be our hope. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. May you go out from this place blessed, filled to the brim with God's Holy Spirit and all that you need from him. Go in the peace of Christ, and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.